Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the panelists for this uh, session of the Eurasis uh, Global Meeting. Uh, our title today is the is ESG and the New Wave of Economic Prosperity Post-COVID. Uh, and a good afternoon to anyone joining or watching this uh, subsequently. Um, the session today, I'd just like to underline, is on ESG in decision-making about investment and governance rather than philanthropy. So we're not debating whether ESG is a good thing, um, and we're not debating even whether there is going to be a bounce in uh, economic prosperity, because we're rather taking that as, as optimists that, uh, that it's going to happen. So what we are debating is whether ESG is going to be taken more into account systematically in uh, decision-making going forward. So we've assembled a, um, a panel today which is going to uh, deal with these issues. Um, so the context is um, the recovery of the global um, economy post-pandemic, um, what has been referred to by some as the Great Reset, um, perhaps a greater awareness uh, of the finiteness of our natural environment uh, and resources, the fragility of our climate, uh, all within a world more closely connected through social media uh, like this, um, which serves to highlight the social differences and issues. So the result is a lot more talk uh, and some action to give ESG issues more important in decision-making uh, processes around investment. Um, others have drawn parallel to the post-World War I, post-flu period, which they call the hedonistic bounce, which led to the roaring 20s. So are we going to dance our way to oblivion or are we going to address these pressing uh, issues uh, facing us right now? So uh, to answer some of those questions, uh, no, no great responsibility there, no pressure, um, is uh, a panel that we put together to address um, all aspects of ESG, a very broad remit, clearly. Um, I myself, uh, as moderator of the session, have had a, an involvement in, uh, in this um, it, the um, impact investment through particularly climate-related um, and sustainability issues with JASTA. Professor Bob Garrett uh, in the UK, leading authority on corporate governance and author of several influential books on the subject. And I believe, Bob, there's another one in the, in the, in the works. You'll tell us about that, I'm sure, a bit later. That's your, that's your plug. Um, Peter, uh, Peter Elwin in London, director of uh, ADOS Holdings, um, family office investor and with particular experience of next-gen issues, in fact, was a moderator of a panel on the great wealth transfer and the next gen issues earlier today in the Sarasis meeting. Uh, Sarah Henry, we're very pleased to have join us, uh, who's director of the Global Center for Gender Equality at Stanford University. Uh, she has a deep understanding of the organization culture issues involved in successful ESG action. Um, and I, I use the word action, not policy. Um, and finally, Angela, oh, sorry, not finally, Angela Homsey in Abu Dhabi, an impact investor with deep hands-on experience uh, across borders in particular, especially in Africa and emerging economies. Um, but we're particularly interested, to uh, Andrew, to hear your experience of working across different cultures, different borders uh, in making ESG work. Uh, and finally, um, Henry Duckworth, or Harry as he likes to be known, um, in the UK uh, with Barrett Fund Management and Jacaranda Capital, bringing to the panel experience in lending to businesses in Africa and elsewhere. So we have investment uh, the investment side and equity, we also have a view on, on providing debt to emerging businesses. Now, we only have 45 minutes uh, and a panel worthy of hours of discussion, uh, so let's crack on. Um, in about a minute, I just asked the panelists to uh, share with us um, a little of their background, but how they became involved in ESG in particular. So let me um, start off, uh, perhaps, uh, well, I've got the mic. <laughs> My career, it was in public policy and strategy at the UK Treasury and McKinsey, and then was founder of a PE fund. Uh, more recently, I've been working with family offices and high net worth individuals on impact investment, um, particularly in climate change and sustainability raised issues. Uh, and one of, that role, one of those roles is with a fund called Drashta, which has a particular uh, angle of mitigating risk through its innovative financing structure. So that's how I, through my career journey, I've arrived at this space where I see we're now able to bring a mix of skills to uh, address some very important tasks in this ESG thing. So, Professor Garrett, perhaps you could also like to um, tell us how you got into, into this space. Okay, many thanks. Um, yeah, I'm not uh, originally from business. My background is architecture and uh, architectural education. Um, but I was working on live project education, which meant that we were... Um, doing our learning during uh, heavy work, uh, particularly in West Africa and various other places, even though I was working out of London. That became known as action learning, became very fashionable in the business, the very early business schools. And, um, uh, and I bumped into a guy called uh, Adrian Cadbury. Um, and that was uh, of great 
interests me because he was much more interested in action learning than um, corporate governance. In fact, in those days, corporate governance didn't exist really as a term. I'm that old. Um, and it got interesting at that point because uh, he was saying that um, on the one hand, we need much more, much better, uh, tighter rules and regulations uh, for the way British businesses worked. But on the other hand, he was very aware that unless we thought about the future, and particularly unless we thought about enterprise and how we're going to make that future happen, um, we would end up with a very regulated system with no particularly exciting output. And that really got me interested, and that's what brought me into the area. Fascinating, thank you. Angela, perhaps we can ask you to tell us your background. Sure. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here with such great panelists. So, look, I'm a Lebanese Egyptian Israeli. So, you know, I was born already in a conflict zone, but I was as well born in a very entrepreneurial family from the start. So, naturally, I very early on witnessed the power of business in channeling energies towards, like, you know, synergies and shared prosperity. While at the same time, in my part of the world, politics were really like inf inflaming divides and causing more problems than they were solving. So from a very early start, when I, when I joined initially Goldman Sachs, I did it really from a social purpose standpoint on how finance and capital flows could be a way to bridge divides between different parts of the world, uh, increase wealth and prosperity um, alongside. Very soon after, I met with Al Gore, Vice President Al Gore. I joined um, a firm called Generation Investment Management, which is a $30 billion um, investment manager across private and public companies that invest in technologies towards a more sustainable world. And there, by, by, by meeting Al, um, I really understood that it's great to try to deal with social outcomes, but what's the point about helping people if we destroy our home and our planet? So it's really going to back, they go really hand in hand, environmental and social must be really addressed hand in hand, and you must do that at a really large scale if you won't really want to tip the needle. Um, I worked with that for a while as well. Um, at the time, I had worked as well with Sir Ronald Cohen, which was someone as well coming from a private equity background that cares a lot about social impact finance and how to bring finance to be something that will be um, um, will be supporting better social outcome for all. And I did that, and that kind of like took me from from like kind of finance first to purpose first to something that is more sustainable finance, which is not so much impact driven, but more sustainability driven, which is other, another definition again, until the day that about eight years ago, we founded our own group um, as a, uh, you know, as a family business, but that become very much a very institutional, institutionalized group. And our group really is looking at how can you deploy capital at scale sustainably, but having like no, um, really like a, um, um, no problem really targeting very deep impacts. So we don't compromise on our impact, but we do it at very large scale with sustainable sustainability um, at the core of it and across sectors of technology. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, Peter, perhaps you could share just a few uh, words about your background and how you got into the space of ESG. Certainly. Well, look, I come from a family background. We were 50 plus years in investments, insurance and financial services. So the financial acumen was there. But I actually pursued entrepreneurial, creative and other uh, endeavors, uh, sports entertainment right out of school and started a business. So it was very entrepreneurial from the start. But I always had the, the fundamental base behind me. I remember when I was uh, going for acting auditions, I'd, I'd, I'd often look like I've got to get the part. And then they'd say, well, wait a minute. We're thinking of giving you the part now, but uh, you come from a family background of this. You speak like a banker. Come into our office, and can you help us raise money and get distribution? So that led me on this true entrepreneurial journey of impact without me even knowing it. I was very fortunate to uh, work with one of the uh, preeminent owners of uh, film catalogs in my country at the time, and he basically just said, look, I'm doing nothing in these markets that you're interested in, India, Middle East, Africa, Latin America. Run with it, kid. So I've literally got a thousand titles under my arm going into uh, these developed markets. And I was also heavily involved in tech by that time. I'd done joint ventures with other family co-investors. And as a result of it, when I was living in these developing markets, that's when I got the true essence and the taste of what impact is. Impact is one thing when you're in a, in a, a, a multi-story building in a major finan financial center, but it's very different when you're on the ground. And I'll elaborate a little more about that. But that was if we can come back to that, that would be great, because I think some of those points you make about the, the practical application are really, really important. So uh, we'll yeah. come back to that. Yeah. Um, Sarah, perhaps we can ask you just to share a few comments on your, your background and how you got into this space. 
Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thanks for having me. Um, so I um, became, I, I founded a center at Stanford, um, a global center focused on gender equality because I really became obsessed with this idea around what does it actually take to have sustainable impact? And was kind of tired in my career, had worked in global development, kind of looking at fits and starts of pilots of how do we actually have impact and wanted to really work to think about get beyond the individual business case to really look at root causes of inequality and think from a systemic level, how do you actually implement that within big foundations, organizations, companies, and governments? And so have really been spending most of my time thinking about that translational piece and trying to disrupt a little bit. Um, similar to Peter, have an entrepreneurial nature and I love this question of how do we kind of disrupt the status quo, particularly in academia and global development, but then also how do we really think about addressing multifactorial issues from different dimensions. So I'm delighted to be here. Brilliant. Thanks for that. Um, Harry, would you share a few comments? Yeah, sure. Um, so, so I started off as, as a commodities trader at the, the world's largest sort of private commodities house. Um, and I was always very interested in kind of what finance and, um, and targeted sort of lending can do in, 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 in the emerging markets. I grew up across Africa and uh, my father was in farming. So, so I could see this kind of direct impact that, um, that targeted investments can do. And, and really over time, I pivoted into that first working at one of the world's largest uh, trade finance funds before going into direct ESG lending uh, and impact investing. Um, a lot of it's based around um, agricultural lending, um, going into to companies and asking for sort of a, a firm remit of, of community engagement, um, often in female empowerment and one of the most important things that we look for is, is kind of water water management which I think as we all know in, 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 in the third and emerging world is is incredibly important um, but you know typical kind of structures of uh, double digit returns and, and, and US dollar nominated um, and clear root exit so so we're, we're trying to pair um, positive and, and, and high returns but, but with a clear ESG impact. Perhaps you can expand a little bit more on, on, on what you're doing later but I think what's interesting is that you're bringing to this panel discussion the experience of lending to businesses and actually helping them uh, put business plans into action so that, that's yeah. great. So I think we all, we've got on the panel here a mixture of policy, uh, academic uh, governance experience, we've got uh, um, investors, we've got, we've got both in the social and the government side so I think we've got a We've got an expertise here which should cast light on some interesting issues. We've got sort of four questions we're going to really address today. And the first of them, uh, moving on to that now, we'll, uh, if I can put it this way, we hear a lot about the SG, CSR, triple bottom line, social impact. Um, and these have been concepts which the um, impact and philanthropic sectors have been very comfortable with for a very great deal of time. Um, in the last uh, more recent years, family offices and some enlightened individuals have been uh, active and taking up that. But what we're hearing more recently is institutional investors uh, and corporates using the same language. Um, so being perhaps a little provocative, is this just hype? Is this greenwashing, as some have called it? Or, or do you think we are truly at an inflection point when we can expect, as we emerge from COVID, that ESG will be not just an add-on, not just a box tick, but part of the, the system thinking? And uh, perhaps as we uh, open that up, um, I can uh, uh, sort of pick randomly uh, um, um, Angela, to uh, start that one. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Mark. So, look, there is a lot of greenwashing. Of course, everywhere where there is momentum, you're going to get people that are, like, you know, riding that momentum and are trying to sell their product, their image, their reputation accordingly to, to that evolving um, market recognition. But the, one, the important point is not that, I think. The important point is that there is no turning back in how this wave is picking up. And that's because of, in my opinion, of a few things. One, the technology, the science and the data analytics that we have today are enabling us to get into a new era of accountability and of transparency like we never had before. What yeah. you can measure, you can address. We couldn't measure before. Today we can. And me measuring externalities means we can understand who depletes and who contributes. So once you have the facts and the data, you can actually act on them, right? And the way to act on them, there's two, there's, there's two ways really that are important that are moving us from an early pioneer, you know, good-hearted people to actually a new era that is commercial and institutionalized. The commercial side is very easy. Since there's better transparency and data, um, it has a direct impact on you know, customers' ability to make choices, uh, on reputation, on, on all these different files that are, you know, that are, that are impacting the top line of businesses and are their demands. <laughs> then on the institutionalization side, since you can understand who contributes to the world and to the country, to the nation, and who deletes it or pollutes it and 
will damage it, governments and tax system will be able to adapt in, 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 in the near future, and it's already starting, in making sure that, you know, tax systems shouldn't be like one tax system for all that, that you totally pollute or that you contribute to the, you know, to the country you're in. It very should be very topical, uh, very topical so, issue. <laughs> we're talking about tech firms, yeah. Now, that's what I'm trying to cut you off. I'm gonna, we're trying to keep the pace mm -hmm. going here. I, I think you raised a very important um, notion there that we've got tools at our disposal now through technology and co communication yeah. so we can have uh, fact-based uh, reporting or even even monitoring so not just reporting we can actually see whether the words are, are being matched by actions on the ground and, and I know Sarah you, you, you you're particularly uh, driven by the the, the, the notion of uh, sort of scientific basis and, and factual basis for, for action so perhaps you could elaborate a little bit on some of the work or some of the relevance of, of, of that as it, as it impacts on this question of whether people are being genuine and institutions and corporates that genuinely want to do something Mm -hmm. And I couldn't agree more with what Angela was saying, especially with regards to transparency and accountability with the accessibility of data now. It's kind of hard to greenwash, or as we like to say at our field, pinkwash, um, exactly yeah. what a company is doing. And what we found, too, is that according to the data and evidence and research, right, it's not a siloed issue where you say as a company or as an organization, I'm going to be doing, you know, um, working on climate change. But we can actually link the data to big diversity and inclusion data to show that by addressing the root causes, you actually have impact in your bottom line, as well as climate change, as well as contributing to global equity issues. And I also think that there's this moment in reckoning in the world with COVID-19 and economic crises, right, that has kind of opened up the the huge divide to see the deep inequalities in the systems that we have. And so I have also seen major motivations and deep motivations and money behind motivations to say we actually need to come up with systemic solutions and changes to the ways in which we operate that come not only from big platitudes of we're going to do this, but that really the systemic change within organizations and from a cultural side too. And I think one of the things that we've learned that this isn't just something you can stick, stick your toe into the water, right? And play on the margins. This is something that is actually a deeply systemic issue and there are solutions that are out there working. So yeah. it's yeah. also exciting. <laughs> it is exciting. And I think the, the, there's an interesting notion behind all that is about uh, as long as things are happening, uh, does motivation matter? But that's another, that's another question. So I think the fact that things actually uh, are happening. Peter, perhaps you can uh, um, add some thoughts on that. In yes. terms of the greenwashing issue and institutions, so I know you come from a family office perspective, but you talk to a great many institutions. And uh, do you find a different language among institutions as you do among the family office community? Absolutely, because uh, as a backup, the issue was very simple. Families were instrumental and ultra networks in creating this industry because they were passionate about a certain movement or passionate about a certain maybe philanthropic cause, but some of them, to make it sustainable, decided to invest in a for-profit. I can give an example of a family I knew that were investing in medical facilities and they would give underprivileged people free treatment, but other parties that could afford it actually had to pay. But uh, the inflection point, I think, is, is absolutely right now. And I think we're going to look back uh, in future generations and see that right now is where at ESG, maybe where private equity, venture capital and uh, hedge funds and other alternatives were 20 years ago, was the policy is being, being, being put in place now. There is a, a, a definite political pressure and also uh, just a, a, a social pressure from these next gens. They want to know, what do you stand for that we're investing in? The issue is, is uh, I think that has held it up, is a lot of uh, the greenwashers were product promoters uh, that try to uh, leverage upon it. But I think now that there's a greater understanding of performance matrix, uh, performance metrics, um, transparency, how to take a proper due diligence, uh, all of these sorts of things, it's coming into play. Also as well, just the human capital element has improved. You had people from philanthropy that were brought in by institutions and they would sort of shrug their shoulders and they wouldn't know and you can't blame them. They didn't understand how investors and institutions operated. And then you've got institutional people put into that framework. And then you have that small minority that knew both. Now you've got a widening human capital that I think is going to create it. Now I could elaborate upon it further, but uh, I think that's sort of some of the... Okay. I think there's a very interesting important um, point you made there is that there starts to be human capital that is a, a, a reserve of people with experience in the area. Because actually, early on, there was quite a dearth of uh, those who could be recruited to fulfill those roles within organizations. So you had a bit of a, a bit of a, a bit of a gap there. Um, but, um, but, but, Bob, perhaps you can uh, expand a little bit on your experience of, uh, you know, in, in corporate or in institutional boardrooms um, when you've seen this 
this debate emerged from when the language first originated. Do, do you sense a change in climate that actually is a genuineness to debates in boardrooms now? Um, to an extent, it depends which part of the world you're in. I would say the, if quote, you know, the outer fringes, quote, um, um, are beginning to really panic. I had last evening a long, long phone call from a very senior director um, in the Caribbean who reckon their economy has just been wiped out by a mixture of Biden's tax increase and um, uh, the, uh, uh, the COVID infection wrecking their tourist trade. But at that level, people are not just um, worried, but are generally panicked, but, but are beginning to become very creative. Um, in the Western boardrooms, and I spend about 90% of my time in boardrooms, although not always in institutions, I think the institutions are beginning to get very worried indeed because they don't really know what they're talking about. Um, and that's where it gets interesting. So I have some little... Uh, and what is though. worrying, I think? But, but it's, you know, life was always like that a bit. You, mm. could, you could BS quite a long way through life. Um, uh, but suddenly, um, it, it's not just the ES part, um, but it's the entrepreneurship before E, and then it's the governance after that they're beginning to worry. So one of my little tests um, when I go into a boardroom is uh, to ask them, well, how exactly are you paid? Because if they're paid on quarterly returns, etc., then frankly, I won't work with them. I'm not interested. That's just not what I'm about. Um, and if they're not, and if they're actually much more like the sovereign wealth funds, family offices, uh, interested in the longer term future, then that's fine. But then I'll, then I'll ask them um, a question like, can you give me, give me uh, the seven duties of a director, which are pretty universal now? I'm very lucky if I get two out of anybody. Um, similarly, particularly with the politicians, I'm very lucky if I get one. Um, and so there is a whole area where people are beginning to think, oh my God, um, how on earth can I begin to uh, uh, reframe for the future? And I think the future is very much in the ES side, um, but it's not necessarily financially driven any longer. What I do see a lot, and I, I work on five of the six continents, is the notion of the license to operate beginning to come in from the community side in a very strong way, rather than just from the financial side. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that uh, organizations had unlimited life, unlimited license, unlimited size, um, et cetera, is just not on any longer. We're having to think much more creatively about the future and how long we're going to be allowed to operate in that future. I, I think that uh, much of what you said is, could be taken as quite worrying, but I think one of the positives I take away from your comment is that actually it isn't just boards in an ivory tower deciding whether they want to do this anymore. They are exactly. probably going to be having to debate how they do it because yeah. their customers, their shareholders, and the, the communities they operate in are going to be requiring it. Yeah, so exactly. I think that, that's a really interesting point. Thank, thanks. Well, we can design that future. Absolutely. Harry, anything you, you want to add on that one before we move on to the next question? You're on mute. You're still on mute. Um, I think I think in terms of um, in the direct lending space, there has been historically quite a lot of greenwashing. But but as Angela said just now, you know, increasingly with with traceability and, and kind of data being used, it, it's happening a lot less. And I think it's going from a, a box ticking exercise of okay, this is what we've been told to do to, act, to actionable, um, you know, product, and, and 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 that's that's the big change that I've seen only in the last sort of two or three years. Before there was just a set top box of questions. Now there's reporting structures that people want. Now there's regularized calls. There's site visits. The, the, these were things that weren't happening even two three years ago. And I think that's a great that's a great point of change. I think that it's interesting you say that with the timing there, two or three years, because there's a sense I, from others I've spoken to that as if. There has been a, a, a change of direction, and COVID hasn't created that. It's just underlined it and made it more urgent. Urgent. Yeah, it, it, it stopped the site visits quite so much, but <laughs> something else. Yes. Um, yes. All right. The reporting structures have become more nuanced, and and I think in a weird way, everyone quite appreciates that because if we're going to be doing this role, we want to be doing well, and it and it was kind of you know we, we kind of felt futility at first in, in just giving this 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 set top box 
list of list of tips and actually yeah. not giving quality data that we ourselves have been um, agglomerating, you know, so. Interesting, thanks for that. Uh, moving to the next um, broad question now, um, which is one about um, the returns, the expected returns from uh, ESG focused investments. And there's been a lot of debate you know, over some years by institutions, saying, uh, assuming that it's a kind of sacrifice, it's a return sacrifice to be involved in ESG. Is that going to be true going forward? I, I remember, um, uh, as I was preparing with, with, with you, I remember seeing a remark about a year ago from a very senior person in the Carlisle Group saying that they didn't think that was necessarily going to be the case anymore. I tried to find it, but if anybody has that, please share it on in the in the chat. Um, basically, they're saying that they they going forward would expect that uh, you would not have to make that return sacrifice. But but do we need to redefine what a return is? I mean, is a return only financial? Or can there uh, can there be value? We see now um, a movement to uh, put economic values on nature. So in the same way with social and other issues, do we find do we need to re redefine what a return is and factor in risk mitigation as well to that? So any are you seeing a change in, in the way that people are evaluating uh, investments? Um, uh, and you know, again, uh, Peter, if I just asked you to take that one because I know you're talking also with a number of institutions. Yeah, indeed. Well, um, basically, yeah, from the question you sort of had prepared before, um, they, they, they they can in true growth sectors. So I think the returns can definitely be there as a motivator in true growth sectors, particularly uh, biotech, medical and health, alternative energy, uh, media entertainment, uh, fintech. There's a number of these new emerging industries that are already there, and some of them have now gained the growth where institutional investors are coming in. They're not at that venture capital and angel stage. So that is sort of, uh, that that does start to put the, the, the story in, well, actually, these are massively growth, massive growth industries now that are replacing the conventional ones. It's going to take time, but you have different categories of investor and some want solid assets and some want uh, obviously innovation and some uh, want a, 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 a balance of stable fixed income, et cetera. You've also got the financial instruments um, that, that are starting to come into existence now, the um, the different sort of uh, bonds, green bonds, climate bonds, those sorts of things, uh, exchanges that are also being put into place that are there to, to, uh, to, to sort of galvanize this. Also, yeah, and, and properly structured transactions are coming, coming out where they actually are properly structured uh, that an institution would have no excuse not to really undertake. Also as well, um, governments um, also do where it not only uh, helps their communities, but also helps their re-election. You've got to, that's a, just a reality of where it is. And they are dictating a lot of policies and institutions um, uh, need to agree, and what I mean, I mean true wealth holders, pension funds, the ones with the actual money, not the managers, uh, on what the definition and the performance metrics and the governance actually is. Um, the UN SDGs were a good framework to get them started, so they can't say that they don't know or they have no starting point. I think those are a good starting point. And uh, also just these, these working groups, um, Frank Jürgen Richter, the uh, chairman and I are looking at different working groups to form under harassus. And the key thing I think is incentivize initial investors don't try and uh, constrain them with wealth taxes, inheritance taxes, punishing the, 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 the ultra high net worth. You're going to kill the incentives of even the smaller people to become successful if they're going to just talk, well, I'll get a universal uh, wage. Uh, I think you need to incentivize rather than just um, tax and then trust the politicians. That's, that's a big concern in the community right now. Yeah. Uh, Harry, if I could ask you, I mean, we talk about returns and a lot of the this debate and discussion is about return level. Let, rather talk that's equity language. So when you come to the debt side of it, you know we're talking about interest rates and uh, what sort of conditions and terms are attached to to lending. Do you do you do you find that within in ESG driven or centred projects, that's a very different kind of uh, a, a different discussion that you have with um, within your own group and also others? Your I think group? I think I think I think it has to be, especially in lending, because it's mm. not necessarily considered a particularly sexy industry it has to um it has to be the same kind of returns as, uh, as banks so that can be hard to find the right chosen projects at first but especially in the emerging world there are so many projects that people won't take on um on a risk side and by blending it with with, with a positive esg outcome there's often certain family offices and, and, and banks will come around to, to being involved in those projects and if you take some equity um, in a sort of hybrid model, um, uh, you can definitely get double digit US dollar nominated returns. So and, and you're, you're dealing with quite a liquid um, asset class. So, so actually, it, it's quite popular. 
and it's and it is growing sort of year on year on year. And um, so I do think that the, the returns can be can be completely competitive. I guess the the question would be that they wouldn't have to be significantly higher than banks. They, they, you can actually approach um, a mature market bank rate to, for some of these projects. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, at at worst we would go for high single digits. So 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 mm. we, yeah. we have a reasonably aggressive um, policy. Um, but it's it's yeah. You, you you're you're competing with localized banks. But local banks in in a lot of the emerging world are not what they should be. Um, there's a huge dearth of capital, despite the fact there's a, a billion young in Africa and two billion young in Asia. There's a massive dearth of capital across those two continents. Um, the localized banks tend to be not particularly well run. And I don't think that there's a huge amount of emphasis on good governance yet. Um, and so th there is a huge place for, for outside money coming in in the correct way. Again, again, perhaps um, um, Bob, if to turn to you, if um, you know, if if what Peter and Harry have said is true, in a way, projects that have got a high ESG content should be just seen as uh, and considered in investment committees along with every other project. There shouldn't be a special case. Do you see that, or or these do they tend to be a separate discussion as an add-on? They have been, but no, I agree that they that they should be considered in the normal way. However, that normal way is changing and uh, the way in which boards particularly um, begin to deal with their investors is changing a lot. I find right now that people like Gillian Tett, the US editor of the Financial Times, is of great interest to me because she's an anthropologist. <laughs> and, and her writing right. skill set, I'm sure. Yeah, it, it's absolutely riveting um, because the way she analyzes future investment is a very subtle blend of economics, but also of uh, community, anthropology, um, and to an extent, environmental uh, issues. And I commend her and follow her uh, quite strongly at the moment, because I think she, you know, we are seeing, well, one of, part of my work starts from a very simple notion that um, organizations and people survive if their rate of learning is equal to or greater than the rate of change in the external environment. And that for me is the fundamental role of a board, is to ensure that the rate of learning is up there so they can survive and grow, develop. There's um, something Darwinian about that. I think I've uh, <laughs> well, back to it. Nothing Indeed. greatly wrong with Darwin. But, yeah, um, absolutely right, yeah. Uh, uh, so, oh, I'm sorry to cut you off. In the interest of time, uh, so we are, we are, we are think, sort of things have moving on, I'm afraid. Uh, uh, Sarah, I see you nodding. You were nodding vigorously earlier when, when, when Harry was talking. Did you want to come in on that one in terms of the return? Um, yeah, and I think, too, I think we're at a stage, two where we've moved beyond it being an add-on, an addition, and kind of add yeah. and stir. And I think we're at this moment um, as, as, as Bob was saying, too, at this pivotal moment, cross-disciplinary solutions, like our biggest partner is the biggest philanthropic organization. We work with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation on their investments. And how do you think about bringing ESG into every investment from a fundamental design perspective? And I, I think, think that's be been quite, part of the ch challenge. I think you're being quite there, aren't you, uh, Sarah? I think when you say you work with, I think, do they not subcontract all that aspect to, to your institute? Um, I would say we're, we're close partners. Close partners. <laughs> yeah, and so, but but the, but we've been able to design, which has been very cool, is to and they're be, doing a big hundred million dollar investment in things that you don't typically think about social returns on. Being able to dig into the data and evidence and show the intersection that they're from a very design principle to say how does this actually look, and we've been able to show across sectors. So everything from vaccine development to malaria to things that we don't typically think about. That if you actually do it, not only do you get better returns in terms of the products you're delivering, if it's designed with that intent, but you also can contribute to the social sector in a very productive way as well, as well as mitigate unintentional harm, because you're actually thinking about it in the design principle. So I completely agree that we're at this kind of new moment of reckoning, but we're also coming up with much more complex ways in which to address and more complex ways to think about addressing these issues, which is exciting. Exciting indeed. Andrew, any, any final comment on that in terms of where you see the decisions making, decision making on investment going you know, in the light of returns or expectation of returns? Yeah, absolutely. So look, for, for me, like doing what we're doing with sustainable impact, um, is, is the, the goal is to have above market returns. And why is it above market returns? It's because we're actually mitigating a lot of risk and we're writing 
the biggest, most amazing secular trends that, you know, that our generation is seeing around clean energy, around demographics, around access to healthcare. Those are massive markets that haven't been addressed. And by actually going and investing or developing a solution on sustain- with a sustainable impact lens, we hope to actually be, be mitigating a lot of risk and actually be writing a very strong trend. And I think long, I mean, I think the days are in us starting to to, to hopefully like subside the days where there was a bunch of incumbents, uh, like a bit like, you know, when the cigarette tobacco company and, and we started to see that cigarettes was bad and they were fighting back. I think the incumbent used to say, oh, I have a fiduciary duty. Well, now, now people really understand actually your fiduciary duty is to understand those risks and opportunities properly and to do the work. Like in every, every, every transition, I would say, um, every transition, every systemic disruption, the guys that used to do it the old way I kind of a bit bothered about having to change the way they're doing it, but there's a point where, hey, you have no choice because this is this is actually what you know what your investors are demanding. This is what society is demanding, and that's I hope talking about the role of government. Um, that's what governments and others will do in internalizing externalities, so that like it's not about reading a CSR report or a sideshow, but it's actually part of the core analytics of the business analysis of the business of the investments. I think that's a good segue into the next question, which I'd I'd like to um, ask the panel, really, which is, um, uh, can you um, give some examples of where the ESG content of uh, an investment uh, issue has been a a positive? In other words, it's been something which has actually helped the the, the the activity take place, as opposed to purely financial. Is there any, any sort of examples where you... You, that's been seen as a particularly a valuable addition to the audience who you're talking to as potential investors or or, or lenders. So again, again, perhaps Sarah, I'd talk to you because it might, might, some of the Gates work might um, might have given examples in that area. <clears throat> Sorry, yes, I mean I think we so in particular working with particular sector experts. So if we take an area like water and sanitation, where typically we think about especially when it's product development, like how do you actually incorporate this kind of intersectional multidisciplinary approach? And so taking something where they're reaching towards universal sanitation. So the question to us was, so now you're telling us this has to be all about women and girls and not universal sanitation. And so being able to say, yes, it's still about universal sanitation, but being able to dive into the data and say, yes, you're still going for the same goals, but you might have different pathways to get there and you might engage different product developers, et cetera, with this ESG perspective. And so when we were able to do that and show the various pathways towards impact or towards those goals, we could actually show accelerated pathways that were able to get that multidimensional um, impact and accelerate towards what they were already achieving. So I think it, I think there are m- many examples of that type of, 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 of work, but also that as an accelerant. That, that's an interesting perspective is to see that as, a, as, a, as an additional value but rather than a, a burden to be carried, as it, as it mm-hmm. were. Interesting. And uh, um, perhaps, Harry, have you got anything to add on, on that in terms of? You know, yeah, sure. Of sure. I, think, I think what I've seen, especially in sort of West Africa and mm-hmm. emerging Africa where we've been lending and in the agricultural spaces, initially part of, part of the due process was to ask them to engage with communities, um, teach local small scale farmers about better productivity, about water, water usage, things like that. And what, 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 what happened is, is, you know, the agglomerators and traders that we were lending to realized that they were getting more sustainable trade flow, better quality. They could count on the product better. Um, there was less issues um, in terms of the purchasing of it. So I think now it's to the point where even if I turned around tomorrow to these guys and said, we don't care anymore about ESG, we, we don't need you to worry about it, they'd still keep this stuff in place. And I think if there's ever a sign of a successful rollout of it, it's something like that. It's if, if I turned around tomorrow and said, it, you don't need to do it, they'd still insist on doing it because they realize that it's a virtual cycle. They're getting better product. They can, they can ascertain where it's coming from and how. Uh, and it's just more productive in the land. So that, that's been a huge success. And, we, and we've seen that and, that. and that bleeds into water rights as well. So, so, so that, that's definitely something I could cite. Bob, I was going to ask you whether you any examples you could share with us where, where in the company culture, the culture of a company you've been involved in, whether you see the ESG angle or the belief in it by a board has been particularly beneficial to, to the business as it's taken it forward rather than in a positive way, rather than being seen as something that they have to carry. You're, you're, you're on mute. Uh, Bob, uh, Bob, you're still on mute.
But Bob, I'll leave you to find the mute button. You're, you're, got, you're off I, now. That's good. No, no, no. I go. got a, an unstable signal uh, on my screen, which suddenly cut everything off. Simple answer to your question is, um, are there any good examples? Not yet, um, but I'm very optimistic. But I've got one exception. I'm working with uh, a really feisty woman chief executive and a very supportive board in the UK um, in uh, a, a PLC, a listed company, um, in the water industry. And um, they have uh, taken a very strong line, particularly um, through COVID, where they have said, OK, first of all, look after our human capital. So as soon as COVID was announced, they said everybody, everybody is going to be employed at least for the next two years. And by the way, you will be on full salary. We will not apply to the government for subsidies. And very importantly, um, we are worried about your families too. So we're taking out life assurance, four times your salary life assurance for everybody in the company. Um, but the, you know, the obligation is then please work with us because none of us know where this is going. Now, two years in, they are really beginning to get some very interesting returns because people have really put their shoulders to the wheel um, and they are beginning to have a very big effect on not only the physical environment, but on the social environment in the communities to, uh, which they serve. And the consequence of all that is the investors have panicked. Ah, okay, because well, there's a little sting in the tail there, but we'll take the good part well, of that. No, we're going to have to leave it there, there uh, for the moment, Bob, because okay, I think, I think what, what's inspirational about that is that there's a culture change within the organization yes. at large, and I think yeah. uh, maybe the shareholders need education too. Um, Peter, I'm going to turn to you, but also use you as a segue into the, sort of the final question, really, which is a, a, a thought, a key thought that you'd like to leave, I'll ask each of the panelists, a key thought that you'd like to leave those uh, watching uh, this now and in the future uh, about how you, you know, how you can make uh, organizations change and, and embrace this genuinely. Okay, well, I'll give a, a, a general one. In 30, uh, in 30 seconds, as you like to say, when you yeah. do these sessions. <laughs> action, make, make, make sure it's action orientated. So yeah. if you've got the money, speak to your wealth manager and demand it and ask them the hard questions as part of your GDD. If you're starting out, research you know just start with your proper research and start with small amounts in listed companies small amounts on on crowdfunding join the online and offline communities you'll find a tribe that aligns and resonates with you your your spirit uh, if you're a non-investor or if you're a very pragmatic um, investor that's very meticulous you'll find the one that is in alignment with your philosophy of how you invest write to your members of parliament congress senate etc um, institutionally of course you've you ask them about the impact Ask them about the risk. Ask them specifically now that you have a bit of a framework from this panel on what to do. And the other two is just if you're starting out, look for mentors and mastermind groups, number one, or form one yourself if it doesn't exist. Uh, and don't be afraid to approach large associations and institutions with these communities. Well, you're you're going to I'm going to have to stop you there. Great, some great thoughts in there. Uh, you sent a few extra ones in. Uh, Angela. A quick thought to leave with uh, those watching. Um, being an entrepreneur and investor, um, like look at industries and roadmap and opportunities, not from the standpoint of what has been done in the past and trying to tweak it, but try to look at it from the basis of what we know today, the science that we have and the technologies that we have. And if you do that, like we did with Ignite Power, you see that usually clean, decentralized, inclusive business models have a much better future. Like all of our investments have made anywhere between uh, two times to like 25 times in just a matter of like a handful of years, like three, four years time. And that's all by looking at disruptive business model and embrace technologies and all the sustainability factor as being core business. Uh, Fantastic. Value. Stop you there, but, but so what you're saying is you can do good business and still um, do. Uh, you know, we have phenomenal ideas. returns. Fantastic. Phenomenal returns. Excellent. So, Sarah, just a, a quick thought to leave with uh, those watching. Yeah, I think this is the moment. I mean, I hear just the call to action. As Peter said, I think this is a little moment in time where we, we've got to save our planet. We've got to come up with more innovative, inclusive models that are actually addressing the social fabric of our societies and we can do it. And so I would just encourage people to dive into the deep end. Excellent. Dive in. Harry? I, I think don't be afraid to ask more from your money. If you're, if you're coming in as an investor, um, you know, decide what particular outcomes you want 
from, from the money that you're deploying and track those very extremely, right? It's not enough to just take the holistic box ticking exercise, concentrating on something that you're passionate about as an investor if you are bringing ESG money in. And then on top of that, don't be afraid to ask for good returns. There's, there's no reason why you can't, um, as we've been saying earlier, why you can't, why you can't get good competitive returns. And if you're not able to get those into the market, go to another advisor, go to somebody else, build a larger diagram, build a larger community around it. Because people should be offering you both. They should be offering the positive outcomes that you're after and they should be offering you the positive returns. Some very positive thoughts there. Uh, we, we are, I'm afraid, um, approaching the end of our time uh, for this session. And I think we could, uh, we could all go on uh, very productively for a considerable time longer. So I, w- I would like to uh, just make some sort of final, some concluding remarks, really, um, that it remains to thank you, the panellists here for this discussion. Uh, I know we all want to follow up um, as a group and bilaterally between us, but I encourage those watching this now and in the future do engage with Harassis, who um, have put together some remarkably thought-provoking sessions uh, in this in this year and in, in, in past years. And then we'll, next year, hopefully, it'll be a face-to-face session in Kashkais. Um, but uh, do engage with uh, with the organisation and, and, uh, and with the individuals taking part within. That's the purpose of it.